Thank you, President St Stephen Vizi, President Becky Savage, Mayor Dan Raimal, Mr. Matthew Makalik, fellow peace workers, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor, pleasure, and privilege to stand here as former mayor of Hiroshima on behalf of the Hibakusha, or A-bomb survivors. The citizens of Hiroshima, as well as more than 5,000 cities and mayors that belong to the organization Mayors for Peace. It has been a tremendous honor for me to be able to work with them and for them since my youth, but especially as mayor of, of Hiroshima for 12 years. Thank you very much for recognizing their efforts in the form of the 2012 Community of Christ International Peace Award toward creating a nuclear weapons free world. I would also like to thank you not only for this recognition, but for the peace and justice work you have been doing for many, many years. And since I came in contact with your community, I've been learning a great deal about what you have accomplished, what you aspire for, and I have been invigorated uh, very much. And it is indeed my pleasure to start the joint work with you for many years to come, for the world and for the future uh, of the world. And it is also my pleasure to acknowledge that the city of independence is such a great uh, community as well. Mayor Raimal and I had a very pleasant exchange you know, about the importance of youth and youth exchange. And particularly, I was um, happy to find that Mayor Raimal was very familiar with the AFS program and the students who were involved and volunteers you know, who worked for the program. I believe it, that alone shows that independence indeed is in the heart of the United States and perhaps in the heart of the world. It is also my profound pleasure and pride that you have invited Ms. Emiko Okada to speak. Uh, she is one of the Hibakusha, representing all the Hibakusha on this occasion. You will not believe her age when you meet her personally, but the average age of all Hibakusha is now over 78. And may I remind you, and especially the young people present here tonight, of the fact that you are the last generation that can listen to the Hibakusha's stories firsthand. It carries with it a special responsibility about which I hope you'll give some thought you know, while I talk tonight. In my own case, I realized that I had the responsibility to learn from and tell about the Hibakusha while I was attending a small high school outside of Chicago as an AFS exchange student. Like most of AFS exchange students, my life year in Elmwood Park was most memorable, filled with fun, excitement, new discoveries, the typical uh, teenage problems such as um, dating and school homework and sometimes um, homesickness. But I would like to tell you one unforgettable episode that occurred in my American history class. Actually, I was shocked to find to learn that the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were described not only as a natural and inevitable outcome of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, but also as a necessary and just act that saved millions of lives by hastening the end of war, and one that rectified the sense of justice in the world. 
I felt that my classmates, who by that time were great friends of mine, should know the tragic fate and suffering of the people who experienced these bombings. I also wanted to point out that the atomic bombings were inhumane because of the sufferings that these people had to go through. As the lone voice in my class, with even the teacher on their side, with only fragments of knowledge and poor English on my side, I simply could not describe the facts adequately, nor change their view of the atomic bombings. Since then, I have spent much time thinking about it and studying relevant matters, and eventually I came to interpret the whole matter as homework assigned to me by AFS, which I needed to submit someday. One might say that uh, working on the homework eventually led me to become the mayor of Hiroshima. I did work on my homework, and almost 40 years later, when I delivered a lecture on the atomic bombings and the message and the mission of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as mayor of Hiroshima at DePaul University in Chicago in 2006, many of my former classmates came to listen. Their presence did make me feel that my homework, as homework assignment was almost done. I believe that these friendships and relationships across borders and through time are the essence of international peace. They demonstrate the meaning of AFS and other youth exchange programs. Please note that I did not say that I have completed my homework. Creating a nuclear weapons-free world, to me, is the final goal. The DePaul University lecture was based on my peace declaration of 1999, issued on August 6th of that year. To share with you what the Hibaksha have accomplished over many decades, let me quote the three important footsteps they have left for us. Now I quote, the first is that they were able to transcend the infernal pain and despair that the bombings sowed and to opt for life. I want young people to remember that today's elderly Hibaksha were as young as they are when their families, their schools, and their communities were destroyed in a flash. They hovered between life and death in a corpse-strewn sea of rubble and ruin, circumstances under which none would have blamed them had they chosen death. Yet they chose life. We should never forget the will and courage that made it possible for the Hibaksha to continue to be human. Their second accomplishment is that they effectively prevented a third use of nuclear weapons. Whenever conflict and war break out, there are those who advocate nuclear weapons use. Yet the Hibaksha's will that the evil not be repeated has prevented the unleashing of this lunacy. Their determination to tell their story to the world, to argue eloquently that to use nuclear weapons is to doom the human race and to show the use of nuclear weapons to be the ultimate evil has brought about this result. We owe our future and our children's future to them. Their third achievement lies in their representing the new world view as engraved on the cenotaph for the Abon victims and articulated in the Japanese constitution. They have rejected the path of revenge and animosity that leads to extinction for all humankind. Instead, they have taken upon themselves not only the evil that Japan as a nation perpetrated, but also the evil of war itself. They have also chosen to put their trust in the justice and faith of all humankind in order to create a future full of hope. As peace-loving people from all over the world solemnly proclaimed at the Hague Appeal for Peace Conference this May, that's uh, 1999, uh, this is the path that humankind should take in the new century. 
We ardently applaud all of the countries and people who have written this philosophy into their constitutions and their laws. Above all else, we must possess a strong will to abolish nuclear weapons following the example set by the Hibakusha. If all the world shares this commitment, indeed, even if only the leaders of the nuclear weapon states will it so, nuclear weapons can be eliminated tomorrow. Such will is born of truth. The truth that nuclear weapons are an absolute evil that could cause humankind's extinction. That's the end of the quote. The inscription on the memorial cenotaph reads, please rest peacefully, for we will not repeat the evil. But Hibaksha often used a simpler expression for the same purpose. That is, no one else should ever suffer as we did. The important point is that the expression no one literally means everyone, including those whom you would normally label as enemies. Thus, it is a message of reconciliation and not of retaliation. I would like to illustrate the meaning of reconciliation by describing a brief meeting that occurred between two important figures who are above and below the mushroom cloud on that fateful day. I'm referring to an encounter between Mr. Akihiro Takahashi and Colonel Paul Tibbets in 1980 that took place in Washington, D.C. Mr. Takahashi had served for many years as the director of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum and was a lifelong advocate of reconciliation and nuclear weapons free world. He died last year. Colonel Tibbets was the pilot of the Eno Lagay, which dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. He passed away some time ago. Mr. Tibbets asked Mr. Takahashi if his bent right arm, burnt hands, and scarred face were caused by the A-bomb. And Mr. Takahashi said yes. As they spoke, they shook hands, and Mr. Tibbets did not let go of Mr. Takahashi's hand while they talked. Mr. Takahashi explained that he used to hate the Japanese leaders who started the war, President Truman and all the American leaders who ordered Tibbets to drop the bomb. But he continued, I realized that hatred will not erase hatred. Hatred will not create peace. I came to the conclusion that I must and we must all go beyond hatred, even if it is difficult to do so. Then he continued, now we, Hibakusha, have been sending the spirit of Hiroshima, our heart, to the rest of the world so that no one in any country, under whatever situation, would suffer from nuclear weapons as we did. Mr. Tibet said, I understand, then continued. It was war. If I were given the same order, under the same circumstances, I would do it again. That is war. In the end, both agreed that they should make efforts to prevent wars in the future. I was there as the interpreter and was shocked to hear Mr. Tibet's words I would do it again. But now, as I look back, I must accept Mr. Tibet's honesty and admire Mr. Takahashi's courage. And may I add that they showed us a form of reconciliation on which we can start building a mutual sense of trust and tolerance, which in turn will sustain peace. Mr. Takahashi made extraordinary efforts to tell his experience as a hibakusha to young people all over the world, as well as to global dignitaries, including Pope John Paul II and the speakers of the lower houses of the G8 countries. After hearing Mr. Takashi describing the living hell he had experienced when he was 14 and the philosophy of reconciliation to which he had dedicated his life, Speaker Nancy Pelosi of the United States praised him by saying, Mr. Takahashi, 
you are beautiful. And that beauty stems from the Buddha nature in all of us. Let me interpret briefly the religious history and the environment in Hiroshima that offers us some hints regarding the path to follow. Excuse me. <coughs> Hiroshima is known as an area where many followers of a particular sect of Buddhism called the Jodo Shinshu happen to live. An oversimplified way to summarize its teaching is that abandoning oneself to the mercy of Buddha would lead you to the pure land. To me, the most significant part of the teaching is that one journey does not end there in the pure land. Once one reaches the other world, one then returns to the secular world to help others so that all humanity will be saved as well. The Hibakusha's efforts can be interpreted within this framework of returning to the secular world to save humanity. Having had a glimpse of the other world, the Hibakusha returned to this secular world to save us from the evil of this world, especially from nuclear weapons. Their actions are thus guided by their Buddha nature itself and are cons consequently universal. This also offers an answer to a question many Hibakusha ask themselves. It is a very grave one that is difficult to answer. Why did I survive while so many others died? I know a Hibakusha personally very well whose entire class died while only he survived. He was sick that day and did not go to school. But he still asks, why? Tamiki Hara, a Hibakusha and a novelist who chronicled the fate of Hiroshima and the Hibakusha, captured his survival in the following words. It must be providence that I continue to live and tell what has happened. To accomplish this goal, the Hibakusha have literally done everything they could. They have traveled to almost every nation on the planet to speak to any group that invites them. In Hiroshima, they speak nearly every day. I know that one of our more active Hibakusha has, for many years, averaged 33 ABOM testimonies per month. That's more than one a day. And somehow, she manages to keep her story powerful, emotionally moving, and directly related to current events. If any of you have had truly traumatic experience and have talked about those ex experiences, you will understand what a superhuman feat I'm describing. Not many people are capable of this level of emotional control and sacrifice. I do believe it is indeed a miracle that we have as many of them as we do. And tonight, I'm happy to report that we are sitting with one beautiful miracle among us, Ms. Emiko Okada. And may I add that behind every Okada-san, there are many who have wholeheartedly dedicated them themselves to working toward the same goal. Behind each of you here tonight, there are a multitude more who also have worked with us over the years. It seems to me that people who have suffered from catastrophic events such as war and natural disaster, almost without exception, also come to the conclusion, never again. Those who have the compassionate and intelligent imagination require to visualize the thin veil separating reality from the other world also seem to come to the same conclusion. All of you here 
share that imagination and compassion. Citizens around the world who experienced atrocities of war and felt the pain of cruelties and violence also have come to the same conclusion, never again. That is why Mayors for Peace is the fastest growing NGO in the world, now with 5,418 member cities. And I learned since I came to visit this temple that this beautiful pipe organ you know, behind me has 5,613 pipes. And uh, that number should be the next goal for mayors, mayors for Peace to achieve. That is, that number of uh, membership, member cities by the end of this year. I think that's achievable. And the total population of these cities is approximately one billion. And one half of the world's population now live in cities. And I do believe that they desire, just as Hiroshima citizens do, a nuclear weapons free world. Shouldn't this majority be enough to make the world peaceful? On the contrary, our minds are bombarded by the negative images of atrocities in the world, murders on TV, child soldiers forced to kill other children, tortures and starvation that go on, and I really don't have to go on you know, telling you all of, all of these. No wonder Bob Dylan lamented, and many singers from John Baez to Peter, Paul and Mary, to Elvis Presley, to Dolly Parton even, sang this song. Yes, how many years must one man have before he can hear people cry? Yes, how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? And the song ends poetically with the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. That's a song. But in reality, I claim, based on my experience and what I have observed as mayor of Hiroshima, that the wind is not the only means by which the answer, the truth, spreads around the world. Ms. Okada is carrying the answer and spreading it to the rest of the world. Hundreds of thousands of souls that departed us in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are sending their voices, messages, and their hearts through survivors such as Ms. Okada to all of us. Tens of millions of those who perished during World War II and subs subsequent wars are conveying their wishes that their tragedies not be repeated through survivors to all of us. We hear the message never again, loud and clear. We, are, we have been hearing this message for many years from these people, and as a result, humanity as a whole has become more peaceful. Yes, you heard it right. The world at this time is less violent and more peaceful than at any other time of a millennia of human history. That is the thesis of a monumental book titled The Better Angels of Our Nature, written by Professor Steven Pinker of Harvard University. According to Professor Pinker, looking back through millennia, we now live in a world less violent than any other in the history of the human race in practically all spheres of activities from the family to the world. I would like to show you a couple of graphs out of hundreds, courtesy of Professor Pinker, that uh, illustrates the point. Um, this is Reagan Gorbachev meeting in Reykjavik in 1986, where they almost came to eliminate all nuclear weapons. But for the time limit, I cut the story short, but I wanted to show you the picture. Um, this is the, the G8 speakers where 
Uh, Speaker Pelosi is wearing uh, gray toward the left. And, and this is Buddha in Buddha nature. Sorry, I forgot about you know, showing these slides beforehand. And these are the people who have spoken to eliminate uh, nuclear weapons. And now, this is the, the slide I'm talking about. This is the homicide rate in England from 1,200 through 2,000. And you can see there is an amazing, amazingly clear downward tra trend toward zero. The important thing is, according to Professor Pinker, that this same trend can be observed in practically in all human activities, including family, neighborhood, business, organization, nation, and the world. To offer a glimpse of this fact-based persuasive argument, let me present his list of five major historical for forces that favor our peaceable motives. Uh, let's see, let me go back, okay. First is the Leviathan, a state and judiciary with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. The second is commerce, a positive sum game in which everybody can win. The third force is feminization, the process through which cultures have increasingly respected the interests and values of women. The fourth force is cosmopolitanism, including literacy, mobility, and mass media, enabling people to encounter the perspectives of people unlike themselves and to expand their circles of sympathy. The fifth force is the escalator of reason, which forces people to recognize the futility of cycles of violence and reframe violence as a problem to solve rather than a contest to be won. Now, I'd like to show you another one, the second one. The second one shows the change in war deaths in some detail. Uh, this shows the pre-Leviathan days with higher war deaths or per 100,000 population in comparison with the post, and this is the average, okay? This is before nation states emerged. And um, after nation states became a reality, this is the number of death. Uh, I believe this is, I can't read it um, from here, but Russia in the 20th century, this should be Germany in the 20th century, and Japan in the 20th century, and this is the average for the 20th century. And finally, um, the last one, which you cannot even see is the, the number of deaths in war in 2005. So when you look at the world average for the 20th century and 2005, you see where we are headed, especially in comparison with the world in pre-Leviathan days. Now let me emphasize again that the mayors around the world who arise from the collective consciousness of the citizens of any city do feel that such a trend exists. And uh, voicing the understanding by joining and working with mayors for peace. They also understand that the five historical forces Professor Pinker mentioned are also char characteristics of a good city. To explain this better, I'd like to introduce as a connecting factor the concept of diversity. It is the theme of research of another professor, uh, Professor Richard Florida of Toronto University conducted over 25 years to show that first, the world economy is driven by key cities and that cities drive the economic, cultural, and creative energy from diversity and the catalyst that makes this possible is tolerance. Furthermore, there is a simple and effective way to measure any city's vibrancy, the gay-lesbian index that shows 
how tolerant the city is to its gay lesbian population. As examples, he points out that Silicon Valley near San Francisco, Austin, Texas, and Boston, Massachusetts have high gay lesbian indices and also are economically robust. Please recall the five historical forces that made the world more peaceful, Leviathan, commerce and trade, feminization, cosmopolitanism, and the escalator of reason. All of them, except Leviathan, cannot exist without diversity. Diversity strings them together. And I'll come back to Leviathan later, but for now, let me point out a few facts. Cities do not have military forces. They have police forces. Cities prosper based on their economic and cultural activities and extend cooperative hands to other cities. Exchange of goods and services are possible and necessary only when people, businesses, and countries are different from each other. Feminization used to be a symbol of being different, at least in my days. Cosmopolitanism, almost by definition, means diversity. Intelligence starts from the ability to distinguish something from another that is different and rationally make that distinction. Professor Florida goes on to show that cities derive energy from their diversity by being tolerant. tolerant. I would like to add that cities remember the past tragedies not in the framework of retaliation, but in the framework of reconciliation, which is synonymous to tolerance, and turn them into a future-oriented mission, never again. In other words, diversity among cities and within each city has made the world less violent and concurrently drove mayors around the world to come to the same conclusion as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, especially the hibakusha that nuclear weapons must be eliminated. According to Professor Pinker, Leviathan worked well to make the world peaceful by allowing nation states to monopolize the means of violence, thus creating peace within that small realm. However, those nation states are the agents of war in the globalized age we have inherited. Even if the world is more peaceful and less violent than all the past centuries, we still have some miles to travel. Will Leviathan save us from extinction? Many believed so, including Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, Hubert Humphrey, Norman Cousins, Robert May Maynard Hutchins, and William O. Douglas, among others. This thinking represented a straightforward interpolation of Leviathan to the international arena. However, from a city point of view, in light of the paradigm shift that is occurring globally at the present time, this may not be the solution. Why? Let me try to explain. Although we cannot wipe nation states out of the present world and cannot live outside of the restraints they impose upon us, the time has come to grow out of the nation state frame of reference when we think about the future of the world. Business people have been well aware of this and utilized this frame of reference to create their global businesses and in running their daily matters as well as chronicled in Thomas Friedman's bestseller, The World is Flat. This year's Nobel Peace Prize, awarded to the EU, European Union, in my opinion, is a recognition not of the supremacy of the hierarchical Leviathan structure in designing the world, but rather of the success the EU has accomplished by breaking out of the narrow nation-state frame of reference. For some of you who need more concrete examples, let me offer two successful ones from recent history related to peace. 
First is the World Court project that culminated in having the International Court of Justice declare nuclear weapons to be against international law in 1996. And the international campaign to ban landmines that succeeded in banning anti-personal landmines in 1997. These historic accomplishments were possible because the key people involved in the respective campaigns created similar grand designs based on their deep understanding of humanity and international systems and the governments within a new frame of reference. And because of that, NGOs, individuals, the media, and anyone else who were connected to the issues enthusiastically cooperated from their hearts. In other words, thinking of the future of the world from the point of view of partnership succeeded. In the case of nuclear weapons, Nobel Peace Prize winning organizations such as International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, International Peace Bureau, American Friends Service Committee, International Red Cross, and many others are successfully appealing to the world public that the catastrophically devastating consequences of nuclear weapons and war must be eliminated. And for that purpose, the only practical solution is the total abolition. Like-minded nations have been working together to sponsor forums to start negotiations leading to framework mechanisms for a ban on nuclear weapons, and legislators in many countries are giving political pressure to their governments to take the lead. Mayors around the world see the future either consciously or subconsciously and decide to join mayors of peace to accelerate the movement through which humanity will reach the goal of a nuclear weapons free world. We may not reach absolute zero in violence all across the board, but we can reach a state of affairs that the overwhelming majority considers satisfactory. When the media fail to capitalize on such huge trends, emails, listservs, blogs, Twitter, Facebook, and other in internet tools spread the words widely and effectively. And an umbrella NGO called the Middle Powers in Initiative, uh, which uh, Brad mentioned earlier, has been successfully coordinating all these components and is ready to move into a new phase. We are making efforts so that in 2015, when the United Nations convenes the Review Conference of New Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Nuclear Weapons Convention, that is the treaty to ban nuclear weapons, will be the centerpiece of that important gathering. Mayors for Peace has been working toward the complete elimination of nuclear weapons by the year 2020 and assures us that we will still have enough time if we work together to, to make it a reality. Before I conclude my humble remarks, let me quote one of the most respected leaders of our common struggle. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who visited Hiroshima on August 6, 2010, that's the same time that the President Vizi visited Hiroshima, to become the first UN Secretary General ever to attend the peace memorial ceremony in Hiroshima. Now let me quote the Secretary General. The mayors for peace have set a goal, a world free of nuclear weapons by the year 2020. That is what I call perfect vision. Looking toward that day, let us pledge to join together on the 75th anniversary of the bombing with the Hibaksha to celebrate the end of nuclear weapons. The end of quote. Finally, I'd like to come back to the peace declaration of 1999. Let me quote again. Above all else, we must possess a strong will to abolish nuclear weapons following the example set by the Hibaksha. If all the world shares this commitment, indeed, even if only the leaders of the nuclear weapons states will it so, nuclear weapons can be eliminated tomorrow. 
Such a will may come from the Buddha nature I mentioned earlier. Since the Buddha nature resides in every one of us, it might be properly be called human nature. Or some of you might prefer calling it the grace of God. I'd like to pray with all of you that the will be born in the hearts of all of us, and especially the hearts of the leaders of the world to abolish nuclear weapons. And we can do that together by singing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the song that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you, and I'd like to see all of you in Hiroshima in 2020. Thank you very much.